Hello and welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. Earlier this month, an oil spill devastated parts of the ecosystems off the coast of Southern California. In this hour, Doug Becker explores how to limit the destruction arising from oil production and spills during the transition away from fossil fuels. I'm Doug Becker. On October the 2nd, 2021, evidence of a major oil spill off the coast of California between Huntington Beach and Newport Beach was reported. The San Pedro Bay Pipeline, operated by a subsidiary of Amplify Energy called Beta Offshore, spilled an estimated 30,000 gallons of oil into the ocean and onto the beaches of Orange County. The specific oil spill caused both environmental damage as well as economic costs. On today's show, we will examine the impact of oil spills and oil transportation generally on coastal health and ocean health. We will explore how our continued dependence on fossil fuels remains a substantial environmental risk with an emphasis on the risks of the transportation systems as well as the extraction of these fuels. Our panel today is Deborah Gordon, Senior Principal in the Climate Intelligence Program at the Rocky Mountain Institute, where she leads RMI's Oil and Gas Solutions Initiatives. She's also a Senior Fellow at the Watson Institute of International and Public Affairs at Brown University and a Principal Investigator for the Oil Climate Project. She's also the author of No Standard Oil, Managing Abundant Petroleum in a Warming World. Jill Sohm, Associate Professor of Environmental Studies and Director of the Environmental Studies Program at the University of Southern California. She's the co-author of Microbial Mats of Dry Valleys, Oases of Activity in the Cold Desert, and the Distribution and Relative Ecological Roles of Autotrophic and Heterotrophic Diacetrophs in the McMurdo Dry Valleys, Antarctica. Ron Tirjima. Distinguished Professor in the Department of Environmental Toxicology and the Donald G. Crosby Endowed Chair in Environmental Chemistry in the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at the University of California, Davis. He is the co-author of A Tale of Two Spills, Novel Science and Policy Implications of an Emerging New Oil Spill Model, Environmental Variations and Toxicology Responses, and Effects of Dispersed and Undispersed Oil on developing top smelt embryos. And David Ginsberg, Professor of Environmental Studies at the University of Southern California. He's the co-author of The Effects of Depth Cycling on Nutrient Uptake and Biomass Production in the Giant Kelp Macrocystis pyrephria and Methane Reduction Potential of Two Pacific Coast Macroalgae During In Vitro Ruminant Termination. So thank you all very much. Titles of environmental studies research are always quite fascinating, but always a little bit of a challenge for somebody like me. But first, Joseph, let me ask you the first question. Um, the oil spill off the coast of California, what do we know about the, the causes and most importantly, the effects of, uh, of the spill so far? Thanks, Doug, and thanks for having me here on your show. The spill appears to have been caused by an anchor strike on a pipeline that is needed to take oil from one of the 20 or so oil platforms off of the coast of California um, to the land. Um, it looks like the anchor strike actually happened uh, a few months to almost a year ago and dragged the pipeline along the seafloor damaged the cement casing around the pipeline, but didn't actually cause a leak at that time or a spill at that time. Um, so something must have happened recently, maybe another anchor strike or perhaps just corrosion from the damage that was originally caused, finally breaking open and causing the spill to happen. Um, the estimates right now for how much oil has spilled are around 25,000 gallons, um, which is a lot. For, for sure, um, but definitely not reaching the levels that we've seen in the more famous oil spills like Exxon Valdez and the Deepwater Horizon. Um, and I think Deborah can talk more about what kind of oil it is, um, but essentially it's a lot of it's been floating offshore um, and drifting south and southeast kind of along the coastline. 
um, from where the pipeline actually is located. And um, some of it has been coming on shore. Um, maybe 20% of it has actually been gathered and, and um, picked up and skimmed from the surface out in the, the open ocean. And uh, Deborah Gordon, not all oil is the same. I understand this is a little bit different than some of the uh, oil, for instance, from Deepwater Horizon. How does it differ? So California, maybe I should say is cursed with not standard oil. California's oil rivals the oil sands in a lot of ways up in Canada, which is somewhat ironic because California doesn't want to, you know, import Canada's oil sands, which are very heavy. California's oils um, have been coming out of the ground for the last hundred years. And as they've aged, they've gotten more and more solidified, tar-like, I would say, in the case of California. They have to be steamed out of the ground. And that's why if you're you know, on the beach in Santa Barbara walking, you'll often see these blobs of tar that you have to avoid because where there are even natural seeps, you know, beyond having an accident, these blobs of tar um, come out of the ground, almost like tar that you would put on your roof if you were, you know, re-roofing or on the on the pavement, if you see, you know, workers out surfacing and, and filling cracks. So this is a very different type of oil than, say, it's coming out of West Texas, where that oil is a little bit more, not the fracked, but the conventional oil there is more what you call standard oil, you know, what we're, what we're, um, able to process. And in fact, I'll just add that California's refineries are very different. Um, they're, they're geared to handle this really solid, high carbon oil. You have to do put a lot of heat and steam and cracking into it. And when you refine it into gasoline and diesels, you even actually get what's called pet coke that comes out of it. It's the solid coal-like substance that's too dirty to burn in America, we ship it, California ship it, ships it off to Asia to burn in their utilities and it's dirtier than coal. So this oil is like really different from extraction all the way through to its end use. And David Ginsburg, I know there's been a lot of conversation about the actual, you know, what this pollution has done. What, what has been some of the practical effects of the pollution, you know, first from the spill and sort of generally from oil extraction off the coast in California? Well, I think the, you know, the primary concern about any kind of spilled oil or gas, fossil fuel, it's, it's really just damage to the environment. And so it's, you know, as we just heard, it's, this is pretty sticky, you know, dirty stuff. So when it gets out into intertidal areas or rocky areas or, you know, hits animals, it can really, you know, cause them to slow down or not function. Um, and, you know, from what I understand of this current spill is it hasn't, fortunately, we haven't seen a lot of, uh, the response was fairly quick, maybe not quick enough, but it, they, you know, uh, only a handful, if not, if even that of birds maybe, you know, died as a result. I think I read only a couple of birds, but there were plenty that had oil on them and, uh, you know, that's always a factor. So it's you know, everything from marine mammals to birds to, to you know, invertebrates and possibly even fish. Uh, but, you know, there are booms in place to, you know, sort of protect a lot of these areas, the, the you know, protected areas that are nearby in Newport Beach and, and, you know, just to the south of Huntington and also probably to the north as well. So, yeah, those are kind of the concerns of, of these types of things. And Jill... How common or uncommon are these kinds of spills? Because, I mean, what you described could easily just be the kind of a combination of, you know, maybe some sort of, of strike against the pipeline, but you mentioned things like corrosion, you know, you know, kind of just general wear and tear of these pipelines. You know, I've been thinking about this this week, and I it's kind of interesting that given the extent of offshore oil in California, but uh, even more so in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, that it's surprising we don't have more um, oil spills happen. But uh, in the case of California, the infrastructure for our offshore oil was put in decades ago, um, decades ago, and it's aging. And I think that that means that the chance for these sorts of problems is is likely to increase. Um, we had the oil spill at Refugio Beach um, 
five, six years ago, and now this one. Um, the other thing I'll just add is that the more we are using our space and the more different uses for our space, which we get a lot of in a very busy place like Los Angeles, the more likely we're going to have some kind of conflict happen that could lead to an oil spill like what happened in this case. Yeah, I was thinking that as well. There's just so much shipping that goes around, you know, so many watercraft here. And Deborah Gordon, it seems like one of the huge challenges here would be then if you have a need for this upgrade, how much might they spend on the upgrade, especially considering that we have to be getting to the point of peak, you know, at some point of peak oil off the coast where it just doesn't make financial sense to, to, to put a lot of money in upgrading the uh, system itself. Yeah, that's the interesting thing about this. So California, it's, its oil fields are depleting in terms of production. But if you look geologically at it, the Monterey play in California there's been a lot of debate. This is the entire basin of oil in California. There's been a lot of debate about how massive it might actually be. It's much harder to frack in California because of all the seismic activity. So you can't really use the Texas and the North Dakota techniques to get oil out of the ground. Um, when you frack, the, everything tends to jumble up geologically and, and close out the fissures that you tried to open up in the first place. Um, but I was also going to add to what Jill was saying that what's really interesting about this unconventional oil in California is it's very high in impurities. And that's what, you know, part of its solidity and everything else. And because of that, um, you need two things. You have a lot of corrosion in the pipeline because of the impurities, a lot of sulfur, hydrogen sulfide and other impurities. And because it's so um, solid, you have to insulate the pipeline. So there are, it, these pipelines are really special. They're different than in other places. And as Jill said, they're aging and they need a lot of tending and caring to keep them operating well. And it was also corrosion that called the caused the refugio beach spill in 2015 so this is could be a look into the future that there's infrastructure that's older that was already um you know specialized and it needs that very heightened attention to keep it safely operating david isn't california a big green state i mean we're talking about the extraction the extraction of this oil but certainly from a social and political perspective i would imagine if there's a state that would be equipped to spend the money for the upgrade and, and, and to protect its coasts, California should be pretty close to the top of that list. Yeah, you would think so. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think that's, that's somewhat of a rhetorical question, right? Because it's, well, I, I think it seems like a no brainer that we could invest in those, in that infrastructure, but let's face it right now, fossil fuels are, are, really cheaper and easier to access than other alternative sources. And we certainly have those alternative sources and we should be using those and we need to do that. And that's, you know, the topic of the news right now, but uh, you know, oil, oil is here and, and uh, you know, met, you know, the question, I, I think it brings up another question though about the oil and gas leases off California, which have, you know, kind of come and gone and come and gone. And, and, you know, why are we still drilling? Do we need to still drill? And if we don't continue to drill, will we decommission these, these rigs, which there's, you know, lots of research going into all of these questions. So, um, you know, right now we're, it's still continuing. Would I like to see it stop? Yes. But it's, you know, it's, it's, if it's not happening here, it's happening somewhere else. And I would like to see all of it stop, but you know, I, I think that just kind of that that's more of just a direct answer to what you asked, but <laughs> we could keep going if we wanted. Jill, you had a response to that. Yeah, I think that one of the things to note is that in general, offshore oil drilling is really unpopular in California and has been for a really long time. Um, the the state has had a moratorium on leases for many decades. But the way that a lot of those leases were written originally is that as long as the companies were still pumping, that they could keep the lease in perpetuity. So we have this kind of historical setup on the way that the, um, that the, the leases have been created that's giving an incentive on these companies to just keep going, because if they don't, then they lose the lease.
listening to Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. We're discussing the environmental impacts of oil spills and generally on transportation of oil. Our guests today are Deborah Gordon of the Rocky Mountain Institute, Jill Sohm of the University of Southern California, Ron Jardima of the University of California, Davis, and David Ginsburg of the University of Southern California. And uh, uh, Ron, I want to be able to bring you into the conversation as well. The oil spills um, off of California, the corrosion, how much is this, is the oil spill kind of a predictor of things we're going to see in the future? There's always a cost benefit to, to these sorts of events. Um, when, you're, when you're pumping oil or you're doing anything else, um, I think on the one hand, um, when you look at the oil industry over the past 50 years, um, they do have uh, better technology than they used to uh, in terms of like tankers and so forth with double hulls and, and whatnot to make things safer, spills less common. Um, on the other side of the coin, you've got some areas where you have older infrastructure, which is failing. And um, a lot of times companies that um, for instance, off the Southern California coast that are working with infrastructure that has been around a long time, it's not always up to today's standard. And, um, and like in this case, I think it failed because of that. And so, Deborah, since you've described the oil off of California's coast as particularly dirty, actually, I didn't know that most of it is not for, for use in the United States. If they're sending it to other countries. Does that have a, an expiration date then? Because I know other countries, some of the Asian countries you would, um, that you would cite have become much more concerned with you know, burning dirtier oil. Is California likely to be out of the oil game sooner rather than later because of the, um, because of the nature of the oil that's being extracted? So California doesn't export any of its oil. In fact, California imports 75% of the oil that it refines. Um, and I guess that's an argument, as Jill was saying, um, and I guess even David was arguing, like, should we be drilling off the coast in California? The only risk is that if you shut off all of California's production, California is going to be wholly dependent on imports. And in this loopy world of volatility, that's not necessarily the place that an affluent you know, state wants to be. Um, it refined, the state refines 2 million barrels a day of oil. So it has to feed that oil. And right now it is mostly imported. Um, so California only exports it, this petroleum coke, which is the solid residue, which I would almost call a waste product from its heavy oil when you refine it. And I think it's, I, I really think it's a black eye for California. The idea that they have a waste product from their oil that they can't, no one in the US can burn. It's too dirty to burn. And it will be shipped to India or China to mix with coal. And it's dirtier than coal when it's burned to generate power. Um, but it's hidden because it looks like coal. So no one even knows the pet coke is there. I think that that's, and, and this exports from Texas as well. It's not just California. Um, but this is, you know, I think that California should actually ban the export of pet coke. I think that that would change the refining sector in California and even change the prospects for what to do with its own oil. But Jill, you said the majority of Californians oppose offshore drilling anyway. It's, is really the question here that a lot of these practices just aren't really known in the public? Yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Um, the offshore oil rigs exist, first of all, in a fairly limited geographic part of the state. Um, most of them are uh, near Santa Barbara, and then some of them are down here where um, Platform Alley was um, or is, uh, and the, some oil islands in Long Beach. Um, so really only folks in those areas who might have the chance to look out onto the ocean and see those platforms that are really aware. But if you would ask people if they want offshore drilling to occur, people are not excited about that idea. There's been, a, like I said, a moratorium on new leases. Um, basically since the um, Santa Barbara oil spill in 1969, which is widely seen as um, kind of kickstarting uh, a modern era of the environmental movement. Um, and, and so people don't want it to happen, but it is happening. And whenever you have the, um, the discussion come up about putting new leases out there, 
um, there's a big pushback against that. And we saw that happen during the Trump administration across the whole, whole US where uh, in states that have offshore oil, when there was a discussion about opening up for new leases, pretty much all of the states said, no, don't do that here, please. Now, Ron, the oil spill, you know, part of what we would describe here is that this could have been a lot more damaging, you know, than it was in part because of a pretty rapid response uh, to the oil spill. But the way in which we respond to oil spills carry their own environmental risks, don't they? The risks of dispersants that are used within oil spills? Right. Yeah, as, I, as I've written both recently and, and during the Gulf spill, um, it's really nature that deals with an oil spill. We, we humans help it. Um, we try to clean it up. Much of an oil spill actually weathers, which is an old term, but there's an environmental fate to oil. A lot of it uh, evaporates um, and a lot of it dissolves, disperses naturally, et cetera, um, and is ultimately broken down. Um, we can use skimmers and booms, which we often use. We use dispersants when we need to. We try not to use them unless we absolutely have to. I think in the Gulf of Mexico, we were so overwhelmed with uh, the amount of oil going out there, there was just not enough skimmers and booms in the world for it. Um, and so you have to resort to those things sometimes. It, again, you really, your response really depends upon the resources that are threatened and, and you're valuing those resources enough to, to uh, put in place the measures you need to. Um, in this case, in, the, in Southern California, fortunately, it turned out not to be as much oil as they first predicted. Um, and I think they did jump on it fairly quickly. Um, but but our oil, our ability to clean oil in the environment is just the technology is just not that great, and I don't think it's actually um, advanced a whole lot in recent years. We talk about skimming, and it sounds wonderful, but you know most of what a skimmer picks up is water, and probably ninety percent or more. Uh, you can't easily skim a few millimeters of water to get the oil, so it's not very efficient. Um, so we don't have really good ways of cleaning oil. Now, that's why I tell everybody it's ultimately the environment that does it. And Deborah, you were going to respond as well. This raises an even bigger question, which is um, there's such there's such a limited amount of transparency about what these oils are. And that so hinders us, um, not even just in terms of when they when they when there's an accident or they leak, but just in terms of how they're handled. As a great example of this, there in 2010, um, a pipeline broke in the Kalamazoo River in Michigan. And that pipeline had in it diluted bitumen from Canada, which is bitumen, solid bitumen that's diluted with condensate, which mm -hmm. is more like mixing peanut butter with like vinegar <laughs> and, then, and then letting it go. But that doesn't change the chemistry of it. It just physically kind of mixes it. And then when it spilled, the solid bitumen settled and the condensate evaporated and, you know, very stunk up the whole area with like volatile organics. And it wasn't even oil, but no one really knows what's in these pipelines. So I think as we've moved to the world of unconventional oil with oil sands and California oil and fracking, I mean, these, the things that we call oil aren't really oil anymore. And we're doing ourselves a disservice by thinking about it in this very kind of top-down monolithic, singular, simple word oil. That's a good point. And I was just thinking um, about what Ron said as well, is that not only, you know, so your point, Deborah, is that we don't know what's in the oil and that's a problem. But, you know, Ron was saying that sometimes the best way to deal or, you know, nature is really kind of the only, the environment's really the only way for these oils to dissipate. And I think that's what's interesting if you go back to the Exxon Valdez spill, which was one of the few times we actually had a chance to really, I mean, it, it was a bit in, in hindsight, but, you know, they were using power washers and all sorts of other ways to get rid of oil. And it was found in some really interesting studies 20 years later that the areas that were power washed were actually not any better than they may have been before because the oil was shoved in the cracks and crevices and the areas that just naturally dissipated uh, or, or, you know, let, you know, the ocean waves, you know, wash oil away were actually, you know, somewhat of a control because they came back and I can't say that all areas came back, but I, I, I guess my point here is that not only do we not know what's in the oil, which I, that's new to me that I didn't know that, but uh, I think from a, a, you know, ecological or science perspective, you know, toxicology perspective, 
we don't actually know how to clean it up either. And that's the biggest fear. And, you know, there have been a lot of, there has been progress in, in, um, in, in this area, but we don't, fortunately, don't have a lot of opportunities to clean up oil, but there are other programs out there, uh, people monitoring the coastline from, you know, Alaska down to Chile, you know, looking at, you know, what's there as a baseline, because we actually did not do that before 1990. So there is a lot of interesting science that's come out of it, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think it's a real problem that we don't know how to clean up the oil. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not something we can do easily. And Jill, you had a response to that? Yeah, I'd just like to follow on with what Dave was saying that we don't have a lot of oil spills and when they happen, they're always an emergency situation. And so you can imagine how the response to it is, is not going to be necessarily very well planned ahead of time. And because we don't have a lot of chances, which is a good thing to, um, to learn and to try out strategies for, for cleaning, you do see examples in, in many of these oil spills where somebody sort of comes along and says like, let's try this. And then it might not actually be great for the environment. I, I was reading bef uh, in preparation for today about some strategies that were tried during the Deepwater Horizon to try and keep oil from coming into sensitive wetland areas, which is theoretically a really good thing to try and keep the oil out of these sensitive wetland areas. But the way that they did it was to release more fresh water into the marsh to try and uh, like push the oil out. But fresh water in an estuarine system is also not good from an ecological perspective. So it's really tricky to figure out how you come up with these strategies um, and, and have science behind them when we don't have a lot of opportunities. And that's good um, to try out these strategies. Uh, yes, Ron, you had a response to that. I just wanted to sort of follow up on the discussion. This is really great. Um, the one thing that, that I always tell my students, I, I look at one of the things I look at is the fate of chemicals in the environment, and, and the environment is as big of a player as the chemistry of the, what you're dealing with. And if you take, for instance, Prince William Sound and compare it to the Gulf of Mexico, you're dealing with basically frigid conditions with very little sunlight versus, you know, subtropical conditions in the Gulf. And, and so the chemistry often drives what happens to that oil. So so you can still go in, into Prince William Sound and dig down in the cobble and find what looks like pretty fresh oil. And that's like putting it in your freezer. <laughs> yeah, it's just gonna basically stay. Um, but you go to the Gulf and it's a little more difficult because um, intense sunlight, warm temperatures, a lot of evaporation, a lot of solar breakdown, microbes are much more active in that environment. Plus they've evolved in the Gulf with hydrocarbons being there for probably millions of years to use it as a carbon source. Um, and so, um, uh, so, so it, it gets difficult to, to not only one predict what's gonna to happen to a spill just by looking at the oil, which again, you don't know what's always in the oil either. So that's the other problem. Um, but then the other is the environment that you're dealing with. And then that, that helps to drive what kinds of methods you might try to use to uh, reduce the impact. Endeavor, yeah, the response. Yeah, no, it was actually a question for the other panelists because um, I'm wondering to the extent their research will be facilitated by all of the satellites that are now going up because we're involved, for example, in a really incredible project called Carbon Mapper that is an, a public private nonprofit consortium, the California Air Resources Board, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, RMI, my organization, Planet, the satellite company, Bloomberg and High Tide Philanthropies, um, putting up ultimately 25 satellites with the way of actually starting to get data that can track a lot of the questions that you are all asking so that we can get much smarter because this industry is not going away tomorrow. So we really are gonna have to be better equipped to deal with accidents and it's an aging infrastructure as you, know, you were raising Doug. Now, before the break, Deborah asked a really interesting question about the use of satellites. I'm going to kind of broaden this out, and we'll we'll start with you, Ron. What are some of the what are some of the strategies and sort of learning from these oil spills to try to build 
a greater uh, resiliency, you know, to deal with these environmental impacts, especially considering we, we may all agree, we certainly would like to see us move beyond fossil fuels, you know, oil, oil extraction as a platform, but that's not something that's going to happen immediately. So what's the best way to build resilience? Right. Um, well, I think the idea that, that being able to understand clearly the environment uh, a spill when it occurs is in, um, and, and looking at satellite information, one of the great things that that can help provide is an understanding of currents and upwelling and so forth, which will give you a good indication of where the oil will go. If you know that information ahead of time and, and oil hits the water, you can right away um, be ready to, to say, okay, well, it's going to go south along the coastline, so let's get on it. And you put your resources there. So, um, so satellite data can, can help a lot and, and we're learning a lot by just understanding basic oceanography, which it can tell us. And Jill, did you have some initial suggestions? So the ocean currents is a really great point. And I would just point out that um, Southern California, the bite that we are in has a really great ocean observing systems called SCUS. Um, and it's a combination of sensors that are in the water, buoys, um, satellite, all kinds of things that um, give us a really great picture of what's happening from an oceanograph oceanographic perspective um, in our waters. And on top of that, um, we are definitely seeing the use of satellites for tracking the oil for this oil spill. Um, I think that what's going to be interesting is we see uh, uh, stories around these big oil spills are, are uh, locally really big and nationally can be really big. But there are more oil spills that happen than just these really large ones. They're, they're of a smaller scale. And um, sometimes if there isn't somebody there to see it, it's not necessarily recognized. And so that's what's great about satellites in general is it allows us to kind of peer into these places that, you, that it's impossible to just have people all the time. Um, and it's useful for oil spills, but it's also useful for understanding other parts of the marine environment. And David, I know that the part of the message here is that the, the warning system seemed to have worked you know, in the California system. This could have been a lot worse you know, than it was. Is that one of the lessons we should take from this is that we actually are getting a little bit better at dealing with these spills so long as we're paying attention? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, I think, I think that is somewhat of a, of a silver lining, but, you know, the best would be that we don't have to deal with these things. But along the lines of what Jill's saying about the, uh, you know, places, you know, for example, the, the Persian Gulf, I mean, who knows how much oil was actually released into the Gulf and during the war and that, that really dwarfs anything that we can talk about here. But, uh, you know, it's interesting when you just look at Southern California and, you know, we uh, arguably is a, a, you know, a hot spot of biodiversity and, you know, even in the Santa Monica Bay, there's roughly, I, I you know, I saw a statistic from Heal the Bay, which, you know, roughly 400 gallons a day is is coming from seeps in Santa Monica Bay, which, you know, it's about 150,000 gallons a year, you know, so on an annual basis, we're just having, you know, so-called natural seeps that are coming out. And, you know, we, we tend to forget these things that, you know, these are kind of artifacts of our, of our doing of, of you know, uh, you know, the use of fossil fuels. So I, I think the best way to deal with some of these things is to have them not happen, which, really brings up the point that we've talked about already here is that there's infrastructure issues. But um, yeah, I think we're, we, we are, I mean, we at least have the tools to deal with these things, but we, uh, granted it's not that great, but we can deal with them. And Deborah, your response. I was just going to bring up, so the satellites and having near real-time information is certainly, you know, we're very much in the 21st century, but I think what struck me about this Amplify spill was, how hard it is on the ground. There is no rapid response system. Like some of these companies have fax numbers that you know, you're like faxing on a weekend saying that there was a spill. It's crazy. So we have, I think that there's a lot of work we can do on the ground to have more. And this is just as true with like methane leakage and a lot of other leakages from oil and gas systems. We we're getting more information in real time, but there's nothing, you don't know who to contact and you don't know how to stop it in real time. And I think that that's something we could really improve. And Ron, you have some experience with that and dealing, you know, with these responses in oil spills. What have been some of the some of the challenges? 
think actually in California, we're in a better situation than most other states. Um, we have the, uh, the Office of Sport Prevention and Response, which is a division of um, Cal Fish and Wildlife, which uh, was started in the 1990s. Um, it's probably the most prominent state agency for dealing specifically with chemical spills of all types in the country. Um, many states don't have uh, an equivalent at all. Um, and so in addition to the Coast Guard and the US EPA and, and others, um, we do have um, our own state agency. In fact, I have a couple of doctoral grads who work for them now. Um, and so that gives us a leg up on some of these things. The, the oil industry themselves, as you, you probably know, they have a collaborative, uh, the Marine Spill Response Corporation, which has been around for a long time. They pooled their resources and, and they try to work closely with states, et cetera. Um, and, and so the way laws work now, uh, whoever spills the oil is responsible for the total cost of the cleanup. If they don't do it, we do it, but then we charge them after the fact. So um, we've come a long ways from, let's say, when the Santa Barbara spill occurred, or even the 1990s, in terms of providing um, you know, a myriad of resources for dealing with spills. Now, on the other side of the coin, the general public doesn't always know who to call because we don't make that real clear. I guess you know, we don't have commercials, et cetera, out there telling people you know, when you see a spill call. And, and actually, I know the, the OSPO folks um, of, often will say, yeah, every, every spill is important. And the small ones are called mom and pop spills. But they still want them reported, and, and obviously, the, because they can be impactful. Somebody could just have a, you know, they dump ten gallons of gasoline off the side of their boat or something, and they need to report that. So, um, so yeah, I think it could be better communicated to the public so that they know when there is a spill, um, who to contact right away. Now, Deborah, there seems to be kind of this potential inherent tension here, in that we want better responses to these spills. This is, you know, obviously politically speaking, socially speaking, we want better responses, but the more and more the message, the political message, the social message is that um, don't worry about spills, we can clean them up and, and we're, we're able, you know, to do so, undermines this drive to try to find alternative energy, alternatives, you know, to, to these energy sources. Do we run a risk by emphasizing um, just how we're able to clean it up and how we're able to respond so quickly that to political actors, we don't have to worry about these spills as much. The thought experiment here is if California were to electrify its entire vehicle fleet and no longer demand gasoline, like that's just a thought experiment here, a couple of things would have to happen that are really big question marks for the state. One would be, um, what happens to the refining sector if you're making no gasoline, but you're still making everything else that the state needs to run, you know, diesel, jet fuel, the other things aren't going away. And second of all, secondly, would be which oil would turn off, even if we did reconcile the refining sector, since the state's importing 75% of its oil, would it just import less oil and be less dependent on imports and still have its, you know, California heavy oil? To depend on. So I think that there are really important questions. It's not just an, I think that this, a lot of advocacy groups and a lot of policymakers think about this as an on off switch, like it's a light switch. And the reality is it's way more complicated than that. And I've been really eager to have those kinds of conversations in a state like California that's as green as it is, that's as dependent on imports as it is, that has such a you know heavy, dirty refining sector. Um, there are really great conversations here that we just haven't had. I just haven't seen them at the, Car the Energy Commission or at CARB. They do great things, but a really serious, almost like a reverse engineering of this sector and what will it take? And so ultimately, actually, I know you've, you know, you've done work on fossil fuel alternatives. What kind of time frame would it take to transfer to say, electrify the, the California fleeter, what are some of the alternatives that might be a little bit um, greener on the uh, on the ocean, on, on the coast? Yeah, for Deborah, oh, I'm sorry. For me. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, some of these, some of these parts of the, the problem with the oil barrel is it produces everything in our modern life. And so there are different time frames and cost scales for changing out all those parts of a barrel. I don't see jet fuel changing very quickly and Californians do fly a lot. Um, and, you know, that will be an issue. There's 
all of the diesel um, and backup power for more climate change from diesel generators and you know getting your diesel and everything else we do. There's the whole petrochemical industry. I just think that it's more than electric vehicles. I mean, it really is going to be looking, having an honest look at the entire barrel and saying if, you know, how is, what is California, I think California is some of the, it's the smartest, it's really the smartest governance and people probably in the room that care so much to be asking these questions. It's the perfect national lab, you know, academic study to think about Rockefeller a hundred and whatever years ago, building out this integrated industry. And now if a state like California wants to really get off oil, like durably get off oil, what does it take to go surgically go backward with that whole endeavor? And what does it mean to start closing out, closing refineries, you know, and changing this? And it's, I think we talk very simply about hydrogen or electric vehicles, but it's gonna be a much more integrated approach to getting off of that. You're listening to Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. We're discussing the environmental impacts of our addiction to fossil fuels and potential alternatives to those fossil fuels with Deborah Gordon of the Rocky Mountain Institute, Jill Sohm of the University of Southern California, Ron Giardima of the University of California, Davis, and David Ginsburg of the University of Southern California. Kind of throw that question open, David. I know something you had referenced earlier about the need to transition away from, yeah, away from these uh, fuels. Um, I mean, obviously, at one level, anything that would be renewable, you know, could have a more positive environmental impact. We have climate change meetings coming up, and and certainly those concerns. Is there anything that you think we should primarily, you know, focus on as as a way to try to ease this transition away from uh, fossil fuels? Well, I, no, I personally, I don't think I can identify one, you know, specific thing, but it's going to take a lot of different things. I mean, if you think that in the U.S., you know, and probably similar in other countries, but in the U.S., I, I think, you know, we use roughly 10% renewable energy, or, you know, 89%, 90% is coming from fossil fuels. And of that renewable, there's probably, uh, you know, a, 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 about a third of that, maybe 20% of that of that very small slice is biofuel, you know, that would probably be a very good place to go. But right now that biofuel, you know, countrywide, nationwide is really mostly corn ethanol, um, which isn't really the best biofuel that we can make. So there's a lot of interest in seaweed biofuels and algal biofuels, which will take a lot of, you know, uh, genetic engineering to, you know, make something that's actually feasible to get into the market. Um, so I think, I, I think, people are working on this, certainly from an academic standpoint. And I think there's a lot of applied things happening, but, you know, uh, it, I, I don't, I can't necessarily say when that's going to happen. And, you know, there are other forms of energy. If we have smart grids and, you know, wind and solar, um, which solar isn't even one of the major, you know, parts of our, our renewable profiles. It's, it's really more of the wind biomass and, and, you know, um, um, no, I can't think of it right now, but it's still, it, I think there are many different ways this has to come from, but as Deborah was saying, you know, it, it's, it won't happen overnight. And I think if in a place like Los Angeles, we don't even produce our own electricity, you know, it's coming from outside of the state for much of the part. So I think, you know, reducing uh, refinery uses and things like that could make a difference, but we still have to get our power from somewhere, especially if you're going electric. So <laughs> it's going to come from a lot of different places. And Julie, uh, you were going to respond as well. Yeah, just to expand a little bit, um, everywhere around the world, but more specifically in the United States, has different resources that they can transfer to. Um, so in Southern California, if we want to get specific on um, changing out this coastal related source of energy, um, there's been a lot of discussions about offshore wind um, occurring. And, you know, there's certain places where that can occur. And then theoretically, as technology changes and improves, um, we expand the possibilities. California is a little bit tricky because our continental shelf is really narrow. 
And you have to have fairly shallow seafloor in order to be able to put in um, those wind turbines. But um, that is one potential way to transfer what we're doing at the coast for energy generation. And there are projects being looked at in Morro Bay and up in Humboldt. Um, those are possibilities. Dave was talking about kelp. Um, but I think that as with any really large problem like this, there's never one thing that's going to be the solution. It's slices of a whole bunch of things added together. And that's why we can't, um, we can't just take any one thing off the table. We need to be going on all lanes all the time uh, to make sure that we have a lot of solutions that will add up to something that will be able to help us replace fossil fuels. Uh, yes, Ron. I'd like, I'd like to just add that that one of the, I, I think I think technologically we're very close to being able to have the tools we need. Um, I think the one concern is where we're putting our government investment dollars because for many decades uh, most of the research funding for energy went to fossil fuels. I remember when I was an undergrad in the seventies, uh, the number was like ninety five plus percent. I, I, in, in a way, I'm amazed where. As far as we are with solar and wind and some of the other technologies that we have today, um, because of that, the market's moving us that way. And it would be nice to see that um, the subsidies and, and research funding gets also moved that way in a much bigger way, because um, that would really push things at a much rap more rapid pace. Yes, Deborah, please. Where I would put that those research dollars, because I don't think um, renewable electricity is so necessary, but that's about three quarters of the of the energy use is still hydrocarbon to do everything else in the economy. And so the ultimate here is going to probably have to be direct air capture of carbon in the atmosphere because we have too much CO2 in the atmosphere that's not going anywhere anytime soon and it's heating up the planet together reacted with green hydrogen. So really basically building hydrocarbons ourselves out of the waste that we've had from CO2 from you know our since the industrial revolution pumping it into the atmosphere and then creating hydrogen you know and out of you know water basically. And you could take our water in the east by the way because we are not in a drought. We are having a lot of extra moisture in our air on the east coast right now. Now, um, what's interesting about this conversation is we frequently emphasize government funding, you know, government subsidies, grants, et cetera. But um, it seems like private industry, the oil companies themselves, um, should have a primary interest in discovering these these um, uh, the, the, these resources. Deborah, you're shaking your head. I was hoping you'd give me a more optimistic response here. Um, because, I mean, I know some, Shell, was it last year, uh, announced, or maybe it was earlier this year, they think they've hit peak oil. Uh, and so, um, but you're much more pessimistic about the possibility the oil companies might have a, an answer to this problem. Well, it's not that they don't have an answer. In fact, I think they need incentives to have an answer. I wrote a piece, an article that I was re-looking at recently a decade ago that um, ran in the Washington Post saying big oil will never get off oil. And I, ran it, ran, I wrote it with Dan Sperling, who's California Resources Board also at UC Davis. Um, and we were very pessimistic about this is the industry's know-how this is their capitalization you know this is what they basically have to do i think that it's going to be the last everyone's going to fight to be the last man standing and doing what they do because that's where their legacy investments are that's you know what their workforce does but there are smarter companies out there and hopefully there will be more incentives especially from the financial community to get different actors in the game but i don't think that that the entire industry will ever go away. The big question is, who is that? What is that industry? Is it Aramco? You know, are they going to be basically, there'll be no more international oil industry. It will just be a few national oil companies that do oil. And my hope is that we can make these international oil companies that are, you know, facing into the capital capitalistic system we have to be those innovators. That would be my big hope. But we have to give them incentives. It's not easy. And Ron, you respond. I, I completely agree. I just um, wanted to make a couple of points. One is that the oil companies are so heavily invested in oil in terms of leases and, and infrastructure, and you name it, that 
they're not going to easily want to walk away from that. And so they're going to want to sort of scale that down slowly as they fashion themselves as energy companies and moving into these other opportunities. But certainly they want to get their value out of all of those investments. Um, the other comment I want to make is about peak oil, because we've been talking about peak oil since at least 1970. And one thing that, that the general public doesn't understand is that we usually walk away from oil fields when they still have more than 50% of the oil in them. It's just not marketable to remove it via current technology. And so, and so we could be pumping oil for a long time to come as technology gets better and, and as the market um, makes a profit for that to be drilled. And uh, so, so we need to, yeah, we need to really incentivize them to move off of oil um, or else they'll probably stay there. Yeah, it makes me think of um, the number of times people will cite the, um, the price of gas right now <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and, and that economic incentive. So David Ginsburg, what can we do to, to, you know, compel society to move away from fossil fuels? And part of it's <laughs> in the classroom, right? <laughs> yeah, that's the, uh, that's the, if, if I knew that I would be rich right now, because uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, it's sort of like what I end every lecture with is how are we going to do this? But I, I really don't know. Um, I think we all want the same thing. And that, and what's interesting is, you know, teaching, you know, working with college age students, we all want the same thing. You're kind of preaching to the choir, but how, you know, how is it going to happen? And, and I think, you know, I think Ron was at US or UC Santa Cruz when I was an undergrad there. And, you know, it's, it's you know, he was probably saying the same thing in his classes. And, and you know, it's, I don't know. And it's, it's, I hate to be doom and gloom, but it's, that it really looks that way. And, uh, you know, I try to try not to focus on those things in a class, but it's, I just don't have the answers. I, I don't know. Deborah, save me. <laughs> I'll save you. Thank you. I, I think that we need greater transparency because we, we can't manage what we don't know. We just can't. And we need to price. If we don't price these things, if we don't price oil, and I mean price oil differentiate in a differentiated way, California oil needs to be priced higher because it is dirtier and heavier and more impactful, whether it spills or whether you refine it, whatever. So you need a true price, a differentiated, a smart tax on these oils, and you need far greater mandated, I would say, transparency. I mean, talking about congressionally mandated open source information. A great place to end on our conversation about the environmental impacts of the extraction of oil, of the, trans, of the transportation of oil, and the need to move away from fossil fuels. Our panel today has been Deborah Gordon, Senior Principal in the Climate Intelligence Program at Rocky Mountain Institute, where she leads RMI's Oil and Gas Solutions Initiative. She's also Senior Fellow at the Watson Institute of International and Public Affairs at Brown University and the principal inve investigator for the Oil Climate Project. She's the author of No Standard Oil, Managing Abundant Petroleum in a Warming World. Jill Sohm, Associate Professor of Environmental Studies and the Director of the Environmental Studies Program at the University of Southern California. She's the co-author of Microbial Mats of the Dry Valleys, Oases of Activity in the Cold Desert, and the distribution and relative ecological roles of autotrophic and heterotrophic diastotrophs in the McMurdo Dry Valleys, Antarctica. Ron Girdima, Distinguished Professor in the Department of Environmental Toxicology and the Donald G. Crosby Endowed Chair in Environmental Chemistry in the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at the University of California, Davis. He's the co-author of A Tale of Two Spills, Novel Science and Policy Implications of an Emerging New Oil Spill, Environmental Variations and Toxicology Responses, and Effects of Dispersed and Undispersed Oil on Developing uh, Top Smelt Embryos, and David Ginsberg, Professor of Environmental Studies at the University of Southern California. He's the co-author of Effects of Depth Cycling on Nutrient Uptake and Biomass Production in the Giant Kelp Macrocystis pyrifia, and methane reduction potential of two Pacific coast macroalgae during in vitro ruminant termination. I want to thank you all very, very much for your expertise and for your time. Thank you. And that's it for today's program. Thank you for listening. The Scholar Circle is hosted by Doug Becker. 
Its managing producers are Ankina Agassian and Melissa Chifrin. Seth Dongre is our webmaster and assistant producer. Our archives are at scholarcircle.org, and our podcasts are on Apple and Google Podcasts and iTunes. Please follow us on at Scholar Circle or me at Armudian and join our Facebook page. I'm the founder, anchor, and occasional host, Maria Armudian. <laughs>